Where should I stand, anywhere in particular? All right. Well, thank you very much. I don't know that it was the first console war, but it was the one that defined my generation, my life, my childhood, and I think a lot of yours. Um, so I thought I would just talk about how I got into this project and also how it has been um, now developed into two film projects um, and then open it up to questions um, that you guys would have. So writing console wars was really um, began with me just wanting to read console wars. I was a uh, Nintendo kid originally, and I desperately wanted, I was just telling Michael, that I desperately wanted a Super Nintendo um, because I loved my Nintendo. Um, it was pretty much the only thing that kept my brother and I friends during this time period. And uh, I remember asking my father for a Super Nintendo in 1991 for Christmas, and I distinctly recall him saying he wouldn't buy it for us because he said Nintendo would then just come out with a Super Duper Nintendo and a Super Super Duper Nintendo. And uh, I guess he was right in a sense, but I kind of just thought he was being uh, cruel at the time since we, this was the only thing we wanted. Um, but looking back and sort of what prompted me to write the story was that he was basically talking about a business decision that Nintendo had made not to make the Super Nintendo backwardly compatible with the NES. Um, and for that reason that somebody made um, this decision thousands of miles away, we ended up with the Sega Genesis, which was somehow a loophole to my father's logic. Um, and I became a Sega kid. And so, you know, because I think Sega and Nintendo played such a large role in my childhood and those of us who grew up in the 80s and 90s, uh, I wanted to investigate what was going on behind the scenes, what was going on thousands of miles away in these boardrooms that led to, um, you know, altering my life and all these ripples that changed the video game industry. And so, you know, my investigation into this really began three and a half years ago. My brother gave me a Sega Genesis for my birthday, which was what we had when we were kids because it was not a super duper Nintendo. And uh, as I was playing the game, I was uh, overwhelmed by nostalgia and memories of how fun it was. Um, and then after this barrage of nostalgia, I thought, you know, my mind was flooded with questions about why did I end up with the Genesis? Where did Sega even come from? I knew at the time that Nintendo was the market leader, um, but I never realized that they were so dynamically successful. You know, I sort of always imagined that it was a Coke and Pepsi type of thing where one had a little bit more market share. but. I didn't realize at the time that Nintendo had over 90% of the market and that Sega sort of came out of nowhere and then kind of flamed out. Um, and so to try to figure out what happened to Sega, where they came from, where, how they were able to really break through, I went to the Barnes & Noble on 86th Street. It's a nice two-story Barnes & Noble. And uh, I was looking for the video game history section. And so I was at the film history section, right next to the music history section, and I couldn't find this video game history section. And uh, so I went to the, the woman in the little question mark information desk, and I said, hey, where's the video game history section? And she literally laughed at me. Um, and she said, there's no such section like that. And I said, all right, well, how about, can I just have one of the books on Sega, Nintendo, or the history of video games? And you know, not only was there no history section, but they didn't even have a single book in the entire store on the history of video games, the business of video games. All they had were walkthrough guides to the current video games. Um, and I just thought that was very strange. I, you know, at the time, I was a bit of an outsider to the world. I had played video games a ton when I was a kid, but not too much recently. But I knew it was a big industry, and I knew that it was at least as big as film and music. And I thought that was really surprising, um, that for such a big industry, such a fascinating industry, and one that has such a pop cultural footprint, that there wasn't a book out there um, that, you know, that a mainstream audience or even a very devoted audience could buy. And so I looked on the internet, and I uh, found that there were some books out there, some smaller print books, some out of print. Um, but you know, the only one that really touched on this topic the way that I like to read books, you know, my favorite books are Disney War, The Smartest Guys in the Room, books about the behind the scenes business dealings, and also just sort of about startup culture. Um, the only one that really touched on that was David Sheff's book, Game Over, which talked about the rise of Nintendo in the 1980s. Um, and it was really great. You know, I never realized that there was this video game crash, this Atari crash that people called it from 1983, um, where a glut of bad games and competing systems that didn't work with one another really led to um, what people thought was the end of the industry. And in hindsight, thinking that video games were dead in 1983 seems kind of silly, but I can understand it at the time because the personal computer was rising in popularity. And I think there is a possibility that um, that would have really caught on and Nintendo wouldn't have been around and we never really would have had video games in the capacity we have now. Um, which is sort of the extent to what happened in Europe where Nintendo didn't get there until a little bit later. Um, but anyway, so I was reading this Nintendo book and I was enjoying it and um, it got to, the book was written in 1992 and it got to the part where Sega 
comes on the scene, and I thought, all right, now this is getting really interesting. Um, Nintendo now has a competitor. They have 95% of the market. Um, I know that that changes in the next few years, and the book ended, and it said, you know, with the promise of multimedia and this World Wide Web in the coming years, we'll find out what happens. Um, and I wanted to find out what happens. And so, you know, I had made a list of those people I thought um, could help me from Sega. At the time, I had no writing credits, um, or you know, and no produced screenplays, so that it was pretty tough to get in touch with them. But uh, everything really changed for me when I got in touch with Tom Kalinske, who was the president of Sega of America um, from 1990 to 1996, which um, up until that point, you know, I sort of realized was probably the interesting time. Um, I felt like in everything I was reading, though limited, it kind of went from A to C. There was this rise of Nintendo in the 1980s and resurrecting the video game industry, and then there was somehow Nintendo had a decline and Sony entered the market and everything got very different and much more modern. Um, there was this time period, this point B, where something happened with Sega. They somehow gave Nintendo a run for their money and then somehow disappeared. Um, and so I got in touch with Tom and then that was really when things crystallized. Um, you know, it added sort of a human face to this story and uh, just at, in, you know, co coming at this sort of as an outsider, it was really helpful to see it through his eyes. I also quickly realized that Tom Kalinske, more than any other adult besides my parents, was probably most responsible for my childhood. <laughs> before I, you know, I asked him naturally, hey Tom, what did you do before you got to Sega? And he said, well, you know, after college I was at uh, J. Walter Thompson ad agency. Um, my job there was to take um, existing product lines and figure out new uses for them, new branding. And so they had adult vitamins and they created children's vitamins and they licensed them with the Flintstones and they created Chinsto uh, Flintstones chewable vitamins. And I was like, Tom, that was all I ever wanted when I was a kid. <laughs> um, and then after that, he went on to Mattel and he joined uh, right after Barbie, the Barbie, line, the Barbie doll had had their first down year. Um, and the uh, founder and CEO, Ruth Handler, said, Tom, you know, what do you think about Barbie? The analysts are saying her run is over. Should we focus on other things? And he said, no, that's the stupidest thing I ever heard. Um, Barbie can be anything to any girl. Um, and she put him in charge of the line, and he resurrected that doll and turned it her into a billion-dollar-a-year industry by segmenting the market and coming up with uh, various different Barbies for various different price points, like Dr. Barbie, Space Barbie, and also working with Ken and giving him some screen time. Um, and then after that, you know, he just had sort of a, a string of hits at Mattel, uh, my favorite being the Popples toy, which for some reason I really enjoyed. Um, and then he was asked to do for boys what Barbie did for girls, and he helped develop He-Man Masters of the Universe. Um, and then after that, he went to Matchbox Cars. And just hearing hit after hit, I was just like, oh my god, I, I should have been much more nervous speaking to this guy. <laughs> um, and, you know, prior to speaking with him, I knew very little because there was very little out there. And, uh, you know, I Googled him and I saw um, he had a Wikipedia page that was pretty short. But, um, you know, that was just sort of what got me thinking about how there was all these great people behind the scenes that really changed the video game industry, um, not just affecting our lives back then, but also transforming it from a series of, you know, fad-like childish playthings into big business. And uh, it shocked me that nobody had really written about it, and I, I decided that I want to write about it. Um, and so after speaking with Tom, my first step was to kind of just compile my thoughts. Um, actually, my greatest resource was one that I had made so much fun of up until that point, which was LinkedIn. Um, I used to think that it was very silly and Facebook for work, um, but I just typed in Sega Nintendo and I saw thousands of people who were there at these companies and it was a numbers game, about 10% of them responded to me and I built up my network and uh, I put together this treatment that was about 25 pages um, that sort of started to sum up why Sega had been able to compete with Nintendo and to get the, no the men and women behind the scenes in these console wars. Um, and this was sort of the baseline for what would become my book proposal. Um, and sort of, you know, while writing about, particularly about Sega and learning about how they were able to compete with Nintendo and some of their clever um, creative marketing strategies, which, you know, I likened a lot to Moneyball, just sort of a smaller competitor with one tenth of the budget using creative means to compete with, uh, you know, the big giant of Nintendo. Um, I sort of felt like I started to employ these strategies and I noticed that one of the things that Sega did really well um, was to uh, align themselves with celebrities that um, you know were hip and cool and uh, kind of got their message out there. And I thought that there would be nobody better to help get the story of console wars out there than Seth Rogen. Um, and so I asked my agent if we could send over my treatment to Seth. Um, I thought there was a, no chance at all that he would possibly respond, um, but he did and he really liked it.
and I went out to go meet with Seth and Evan in January of 2012, and uh, we talked about um, our experiences. And Seth and Evan, they're uh, writing, directing, business partners. Um, and the best part about that is that they're childhood friends. So everything we were talking about resonated with them and brought back memories just as it had been doing for me. Um, and we ended up deciding that they would produce the feature film version based on my book, which I still had yet to write. I had even yet to write a book proposal. Um, and so that added a lot of pressure. Um, and then also, they were going to produce a documentary. And so having them uh, in our corner, and then eventually having Scott Root in our corner as well, uh, was really you know, the best compliment I could have possibly received, aside from the fact that it was just really wonderful to have them. Um, meanwhile, you know, at that point, I still had not been uh, very successful in the writing world. And I remember meeting with Seth and Evan on a Thursday. And then Monday, I was back at my day job trading commodities. Um, and I felt like there's something wrong with this picture that I just met my hero, and here I am uh, back trading commodities. But um, it ended up working out really well how much time I had. Um, you know, I ended up spending three years researching and writing this project. And uh, although at any point I would have loved to have just left my job and you know, have this book in stores, um, having that extra time really helped me build relationships with these people. Um, and specifically in the case of Nintendo, which is a very interesting and very secretive, closed off company, um, having that extra time was really useful to uh, trying to push down those barriers and uh, using whatever leverage I picked up along the way to get them to uh, speak with me. But anyway, um, you know, one thing that I always found kind of surprising um, going back to how strange it was to me that there was no video game history section and there were so few video game books, even when uh, I had Seth and Evan and Scott on board doing this feature film and also doing this documentary, when the, when the book proposal went out, um, it went out to 24 publishers and 21 of them passed and the reason was video game books don't sell. And I thought that was very odd because you know, there had been so few video game books and that was the reason I wanted to write this book. Uh, but HarperCollins uh, you know, saw the potential in it and saw it as sort of that money ball, um, accidental billionaire social network type of story. And uh, I sold the book proposal to them and I got to quit my commodity job and work on this full time. And uh, I spent all of 2013 writing the book and also directing the documentary. And uh, you know, as I mentioned earlier, one of the things I didn't realize at all was how successful Nintendo was. I knew that they were that market leader, but I didn't realize that they had 95% of the market and that they had done that by really just controlling everything. Um, hearing it mostly from the Sega perspective at first um, caused me to see Nintendo as kind of the villain in this story, or at least the Goliath in this David and Goliath tale. Um, but kind of a turning point for me was uh, likening them to Apple and just seeing their obsession with uh, having a closed system, a closed network, and controlling every aspect of the experience. And I can understand why that rubs people the wrong way. And I can also understand why some people would sympathize with that. Um, but I got to hear about everything from uh, Sega. And some of my favorite stories from there um, in, in terms of the sort of money ball strategies was the one that really hooked me and got me early on um, in my first conversation with Tom was, you know, Nintendo was so dominant that they accounted for about 25% of revenues at retailers um, in 1989. In 1989, actually, of the top 30 toys, 25 of them were Nintendo or Nintendo-related products. And they just, they just really had such a stranglehold on this industry, um, and to the point where the suggested retail price was not just a suggestion, and that led to antitrust lawsuits in uh, 1991. Um, but, you know, Sega they had what they thought was a superior system, which was the 16-bit Genesis that was out before Nintendo had the Super Famicom or the 16-bit Super Nintendo. Um, and so they went to Walmart, uh, which was one of the important retailers at the time, and they pitched the Sega Genesis to the electronics merchant. And he thought, you know, this is a great system. I could see people enjoying this and buying this. And so Tom thought, all right, great. You know, we'll give you an order form. And he said, no. Um, you know, they did, they did not want to carry Genesis products for fear of upsetting Nintendo. Nintendo was so strict um, and also uh, so reactionary that if people ever changed the price or if people did things they didn't enjoy, um, they would, you know, shipments would mysteriously vanish and they wouldn't get their full orders. Um, and so Sega knew that this is what they were up against and uh, they used some sort of grassroots campaign. They, uh, Tom and Shinobu Toyota, his right-hand man, were leaving Bentonville, Arkansas after another bad meeting that went along these lines. And they 
uh, were in a cab and they saw that there was a retail space, you know, a big mall across the street from uh, Walmart's headquarters in Bentonville. And they went inside, they uh, asked to take a look at the space, they ended up buying the space and they turned this into a Genesis store where people can come in for free across the street from Walmart headquarters, play Genesis. They didn't sell the Genesis, um, so this way everyone that went in there and liked it would go into the flagship Walmart and say, hey, can I get a Genesis? And they would be told no. Um, and eventually this got so bad with not only that, but they bought every billboard in town, they bought um, seat warmers at the, f at the college football games there, and eventually the Walmart uh, electronics merchant called Tom and said, we raised the right flag, my bosses are killing me, just please get rid of that store, we'll carry the Genesis. Um, and so it was a lot of strategies like that that really got me into this book because um, you know those are just universal business stories. And as I mentioned earlier, my favorite books are sort of ones about the tech industry and about um, startup culture and about how underdogs can compete with uh, people like Nintendo. And uh, you know there was a lot of stories I found along the way, but I'd love to answer questions uh, that you guys might have. Um, I think that might be a better way to discuss this. Anybody have any questions? Well, how about, uh, before we do that, a show of hands of who was on uh, Team Nintendo and who was on Team Sega back in the day. Who here had a Genesis? And what about a uh, Super Nintendo? It's kind of evenly split. Um, and who here got beat up on the schoolyard finding this out? <laughs> um, all right, so how, any questions that you guys might have? Hey. So, I mean, we're seeing Nintendo having a bit of a struggle currently. Yep. Um, against like things like you know, Xbox and, and PlayStation Three or Four, whatever. Um, are you seeing any parallel now that is happening between that happened between Sega and Nintendo that's happening currently with current consoles? Absolutely. Um, you know, the book came out about a month ago, and in most of the times that I've been able to speak with people about it, they inevitably ask, you know, what do you think of Nintendo nowadays? Um, they're a distant third in the market. Um, and, you know, though the book really focuses on 1990 to 1996, from the NES to the Sega Saturn Nintendo 64, you really learn about Nintendo and sort of the blueprint of the company and just their strategy. And it's not surprising at all to me that they're in the position that they are today. Um, the last section of the book, which is broken into five sections, is called The Tortoise and the Hare. And I think that Nintendo this, during this time really was very much the tortoise, just uh, kind of not reacting to Sega uh, for a while, very much to their detriment. And then in the end, uh, particularly because of Donkey Kong Country and because they stuck with the Super Nintendo while Sega got more into hardware and the 32X and the Sega CD, Nintendo ended up winning with the extension of the life cycle. Um, but you know, thinking about the, 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 the parable of the tortoise and the hare, it's really kind of just a matter of where the finish line is. If, the finish line had been in 1993, you would have said they are idiotic not to react and not to change what they were doing. Um, and I think that's a little bit of the case right now. Um, I was at E3 last week, and Nintendo showcased a lot of great new games, so maybe they'll turn it around. But if, you know, if the finish line was right now, they failed. Um, and that kind of shows their failure to adapt. Um, they still make games for families and for small children. Um, and I had an opportunity to meet with uh, their, their current president, I asked him about, you know, one of the best things that Nintendo has, their greatest assets is their IP, uh, all those great IPs, and I said, you know, you guys make great games, I have a Wii U, there's no doubt that Mario Kart 8 is fantastic, but also, you know, I'm 31 years old now, I grew up with Mario and Zelda and Kirby, and, you know, as much as you're still appealing to young kids, there's also those of us who grew up that would maybe like to see you do more with the IP that appeals to us, maybe, um, you know, TV shows, movies, um, things with a little bit more adult themes that don't need to be, uh, you know, killing and gory stuff. But uh, I think Nintendo has really dropped the ball in that capacity. And that's why you see them so far behind um, Sony and Microsoft. And, you know, the one thing that I really saw with Nintendo throughout this process is that they were so um, not into the marketing of the games. and. You know, they really focused on product development, and, and as consumers, you know, for the most part, that's a good thing. Um, but it's also not. A, but it, it becomes a bad thing when I want to play the Wii U with friends and nobody has it because Nintendo doesn't really know what they're doing with this. You know, it comes with a tablet, the Wii U. I don't really understand why. Um, I think that 
you know, in a lot of my stories about playing consoles, it was always we, me and my brother. And if there was one tablet between the two of us, that would have gone very poorly. Um, so those are sort of the marketing decisions that I think Nintendo just, you know, seems to shrug off and say, we don't care about that. We, as long as we have good games, um, that's really hurt them. And uh, back then, you know, losing in the console wars, at least at first, um, wasn't the worst thing in the world because they had a war chest of money saved up from their Nintendo success. And they also, you know, making games at that time cost about a million, maybe two million dollars, whereas nowadays it can cost tens of millions of dollars, um, not to mention the hardware. So, you know, falling behind is not such a simple fix as it was back then. So, slightly unfair question about a different like, game over again, because I've read that book but not read your book. Yeah. Uh, but you brought it up. So, apparently, Nintendo back in the day wouldn't let you lower the price. I never understood why Nintendo cared. Like, if I'm Nintendo and I sell you a bunch of video games for $30 a piece, and you want to cannibalize yourself by selling it for $32 rather than the suggested price of $40 or $50, what, what skin off Nintendo's back is that? I never understood why they cared. They clearly did care. No, was they it absolutely just care. Irrational or. Did they have some reason behind it? Um, you know, from the Nintendo mindset, they, um, you know, there was a sense that they thought they were doing God's work. But they also thought that to do that work, it was to absolutely control um, the quantities of things. You know, in their mind, they saw the Atari crash, the video game crash, resulting from um, not just a glut of bad products, but just a glut of too many products and too many choices. And uh, even Mr. Arakawa, Minoru Arakawa, the president, when people would say, oh, you know, Zelda is doing great in Japan, why don't we bring it over here? He would say, no, you know, I want only this one game to really be played by people at one time. You know, so even in that situation where it seemed like, what do you have to lose? You know, you're not really cannibalizing yourself, you're bringing another game. Um, they really wanted to dictate every aspect of the consumer experience, and sometimes it was to the detriment. You know, I understand, you know, they, they sued Galoob, who were the makers of the game Genie, because they felt like that altered their copyright and uh, you know, the Game Genie was sort of uh, video game steroids to help you, um, cheat, you know, cheat to get the higher levels and extra lives. Um, so I sort of understand Nintendo believing that that changed the integrity of their products and I can understand them entering litigation there. But what I never understood was they went after Blockbuster and mom and pop video stores for renting out their games. And to me that seemed like another situation where if they wanted the best experience for their consumers, um, you know, having the chance to play the games before. Back then, you'd spend $50, and without the internet, it was kind of just based on the back of the box. Um, you know, that seemed like, why would they be so um, vigilant about trying to control that? Um, so I wish I had a better answer for you, other than that they just seemed um, very obsessed with controlling everything and doing everything on their own terms. Hey. So, uh, to keep it on Nintendo, um, you talked about how they're a very sort of tend to be closed off company and not like to talk. Did you find in your process that it was easier to talk to maybe former Nintendo employees than people who have are still there and had been there back in the day? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, because one, because there's so few former Nintendo employees. Um, Sega was based in Redwood Shores and prior to that was in South San Francisco. And so they really were, um, you know, in Silicon Valley or just sort of in the area where a lot of tech was going on and also um, that mentality where it was understandable to go into and out of a company and to do something for a short amount of time and come out. Whereas Nintendo was really much more like the traditional Japanese company where once you signed up there and you know decided you were going to be there, you were kind of there for the rest of your life. So there were, so speaking with people from Nintendo, um, I felt like they were all kind of lifers. Um, of, you know, about. 25% of the people I want to speak with were still there, but even the 75% had all left in the past five years and were all very protective of the company. And I think the, um, because the premise of my project was Sega and Nintendo, um, that was like a dreaded word, Sega, and it just brought back bad memories. Um, you know, it was really hard to speak with them at first, and that was where it ended up being very positive that the project took three years. Um, Howard Lincoln was the uh, senior vice president of, of Nintendo of America. He went on to become the chairman in 1994 after uh, the president of NCL, the parent company of Nintendo, thought that his son-in-law was doing a bad job and sort of put Howard in charge um, for what he thought was failure with the uh, Super Nintendo. And you know, I contacted Howard three years ago. I actually contacted the secretary, and she said, sorry, Howard's busy. 
contacted a few months later. Sorry, Howard's busy. I contacted Howard directly because I figured out the email structure, and she said, please don't contact Howard directly. <laughs> and so you know, I kept trying to contact them because um, you know, not only was I just curious what he would have to say, but I also thought that it was unfair as a journalist to get most of the story from Sega, even though the story was kind of becoming more about Sega. Um, and that was where having uh, you know, a, book, a book sold and having Seth on board put me in a good spot, because eventually in early 2013, I said, you know, I know that I'm not supposed to Howard, contact Howard directly, um, but there's going to be two movies and a book, and Howard and many others are you know, featured a lot in this story. Um, and up to this point, it's almost exclusively from his competitor's perspective. Um, I think that you know, if he's OK with that, I'm OK with that, but he might want to rectify it. And even in that situation where um, his secretary wrote back and said, oh, OK, I think we should really get Howard in on this now. <laughs> Um, so they decided like this seemed like a good idea. I spoke. They put me in touch with Golan Harris, their ad agency, and I told them about my project. And that was in March of 2013. Um, it took them two and a half months to get back to me, and they said I was approved to speak with Howard. And I was really excited. And I contacted all the people from Nintendo of America um, to let them know, because um, that sort of was implicit approval from Nintendo of America, because Howard is currently the CEO of the Mariners, which Nintendo owns. Um, so they were like, all right, now I feel even better about speaking with you. I'll speak with you on camera. And then two days later, uh, Golan Harris told me, oh, actually, your status is back to pending um, with no, act you know, no explanation. And uh, then everyone that I had told from Nintendo America thought I was lying to them when I told them I had approval from Howard. Um, and eventually it got to the point where I was going out there to film last year um, six people, not including Howard Lincoln. Um, Nintendo of America called all of them, reminded them about their NDA agreements, um, did as much as they could to get them to not speak with me. Um, but luckily, a few of them did feel like um, not only that they had built a relationship with me, but also that, like, guys, if we don't get in on this, this is just going to, they're going to railroad us. We're not going to get to tell our side of the story. Um, and that went well. And then eventually, uh, I got a call and they said, OK, you can speak with Howard. Um, but I had a, yeah. So, you know, from my perspective, that is also kind of indicative of where Nintendo, of why they are where they are today. Um, not that, I, you know, I think that they should have said three years ago, OK, this random writer with no credits, we should, you know, make the time to speak with him. But it was just that every step along the process felt like it was 10 times harder than it needed to be. Um, and in the end, all I was really trying to do was to tell their story and the more information I had. Um, especially in the sense that I was writing it where I wanted it to be as collaborative as possible and share the chapters as I was going. Um, I felt like it could only help them, and I felt like they were just um, you know, hurting themselves. Um, though I think that in the past year, they've you know, actually the, the found, not the founder, the, the previous head of Nintendo who was there for several decades, Hiroshi Yamuchi, passed away. And I think that things are changing a little bit. Um, and uh, that was my experience with Nintendo. Hey, sorry. Hi. <clears throat> uh, so if you'll forgive me for geeking out for a second. Um, That's all right. Uh, a couple of related points is something I find interesting about Nintendo's history is uh, both the, the gimmicks and uh, all the accessories and the diversification of their product line. So there's things like the, uh, the Virtual Boy and the 3DS and the uh, 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 product lines, like I said, the the Game Boy especially, there's the original, and then there's the Pocket, and there's the Color, and then there's the Advance, and the Advance SP, and the Advance Micro, and the <laughs> DS, and the DSi, and the 3DS, and the 3DS XL, and there all the little crazy accessories like the mouse for the Super Nintendo, and the Super Scope, and so many more things, and including huge lists that never made it out of Japan. <laughs> right. um, so that's one of the things I find really interesting about Nintendo's history. I wondered if you have any ideas or comments there, or if that factors into your book at all. Um, it does. Um, well, two things come to mind. One is what was always really interesting to me in the console wars, you know, these big, great 16-bit machines, you know, metaphorically fighting against one another. For Nintendo, what really helped them sustain, other than the profits that they had gained from the 80s, was the Game Boy. That was sort of the revenue stream that always kept them going. Uh, I think the Game Gear was at least cooler. Uh, it had color. I had one. Uh, that was what I, you know, thought made me cool back then. But the battery life was terrible. The games weren't as good. Um, and that was kind of what kept Nintendo afloat. The, the one thing I always really respected about Nintendo with the peripherals, um, even including disasters like Virtual Boy, um, was they never let that um, 
you know, I guess just because they weren't so heavily emphasized on the marketing, they never really let that um, change their narrative. They were there to kind of give you the console experience, and if you wanted, you would get these other things. Whereas I think Sega did a little bit more of throwing them in your face and trying to make them much more aspirational. And uh, particularly in the case of the Virtual Boy, which I think most people would agree was a terrible product, or at least not um, you know, one that they really should have put both feet into, um, the people that I spoke with from Nintendo of America said, you know, we kind of knew we had a dog, and they were pretty blunt about that with the retailers. Um, so it did come out, and there were commercials, but they didn't um, really throw it out there um, and put a lot of money behind it the same way that Sega did with the 32X, which was another product that people didn't really enjoy and felt like um, created baggage and was showed distrust between Sega and their consumers. So I think you know it speaks to Nintendo always trying to innovate, even though they can be a little stiff and rigid in certain areas of the company. They you know they also had a knitting machine. Um, they're willing to try things, and uh, that is pretty impressive. Uh, one other thing I like that is not in the book was they did a online lottery in Minnesota in 1991. Um, and you know, so they were willing to try things, but I think in the end, uh, Nintendo has built a trust with their consumers that they're not going to really push for things that aren't worth buying. And I think that counts for a lot for a company that's been around as long as they have and has done the same sort of thing over and over. Thanks. Thank you. Sure. Uh, so, how much of the structure of the console industry today uh, do you think was shaped by the console wars between Nintendo and Sega? So, like things like you know, we think about the four to seven year sort of console life cycle and first party versus third party games and uh, subsidized or at least break even hardware. Is that all stuff that's sort of inevitable or is that defined in this era? I mean, personally, I think a lot of it was defined in this era um, since we don't have the experiment of not having the war. We don't really know for sure. But um, for, for the, the most important thing, I think, that also kind of seems like a no duh in hindsight is just that. Um, there was two competitors in the market, and they were both very profitable. Um, up until that point, I think Atari had been very profitable in the 70s, and then Mattel and Coleco came along, and that kind of ruined the balance of power and led to the industry, at least from one perspective, to spiral out of control. Um, and there was a sense that you know the console industry could really only sustain one company, and maybe it would be, um, say, a Nintendo would fail. But the fact that both of them were able to succeed, and then even Sony came into the ring and also found success, I think. That alone is pretty pivotal in terms of giving the confidence eventually for Sony and Microsoft to enter um, and for both of them to be successful. And then, you know, one thing that even speaks to what Nintendo does today is they are focused on children and, uh, you know, that family friendly type of product. Um, you know, back then, the games, I remember buying most of them at Toys R Us and KB Toys, and um, it was really a toy product. And I think that what Sega did which was primarily from financial necessity at first, in terms of just zigging wherever Nintendo zagged, they went after adults and teens and a different demographic, and they turned it more into a consumer electronic um, and into a bigger business. And uh, so I think that there was a big um, tectonic shift of what console business could be through what Sega was doing, through uh, who they were advertising to. Um, and then you just see throughout the book there's a lot of innovations just in terms of you know the first street date for a video game. Um, nowadays, that seems kind of commonplace. But back then, um, it was kind of like, we'll get it to these retailers whenever we get it to them, and then we'll get it to these guys. Um, and not only was that you know a problem for just not being able to look forward to like, oh, this game comes out on September 17th. But you know Sega did such a great job of sort of um, Hollywoodizing the industry and building up the months of hype leading up to that date. Um, so I think that there was a lot of changes during that period, um, mostly from the marketing standpoint of Sega, and then also just from the infrastructure. Um, you know, one of the climaxes of the book is the Senate subcommittee hearings in December of 1993, where Joseph Lieberman brought Sega and Nintendo down to Washington to talk about how violent these games were becoming, which um, maybe looking back don't seem that violent, but it was Mortal Kombat and a game called Night Trap, which was a terrible game um, that was actually invented seven years earlier, and <laughs> it was just silly to me that it was involved. But you know, the resolution to these, these subcommittee hearings was that um, Sega and Nintendo had to put down their swords and kind of work together. Um, the only way that they would get out of the government taking control and regulating the industry and basically just controlling what went in and out and 
hurting both these companies in the long run was to get them to sit at a table together. And it was fun in the book to actually write about that meeting where they have to sit at the table together. Um, and they just hated the, any idea that the other one came up with. Um, just for the sake of, you know, in the end, they came up with a rating system that was almost identical to Sega's rating system, but, but Nintendo wouldn't have adopted that right away because it was Sega's, so they had to, you know, work together. Um, and so, long story short, what they came up with was the ESRB, the ratings board. They also came up with uh, the trade association, which puts on the E3 um, trade show each year for the video game industry. Up until that point, all of the sort of the big presentations and the big news and the only time that actually the Sega and Nintendo people would interact in person was at the consumer electronic shows um, in Chicago and Vegas, and now they had their own show. Um, and sort of, as much as my book is the story of these characters, these pioneers, and as much as it is, is about Sega and how they were able to use these underdog strategies, it really is just about the maturation of the industry um, during that five-year stretch to go from Nintendo controlling it all and selling their toy, the, telling their games in toy stores to having the first E3 show and having sort of that we've arrived moment. So I seem to remember hearing a story about how, at one point, Nintendo basically had the opportunity to buy like what became the PlayStation right. at some point in the 90s. I wonder if you had any just comments on that from your the research. Sure. Um, so <laughs> there was a point when uh, I was writing the book. You know, I would say early on, my biggest inspirations were Moneyball and uh, Ben Mesrick's Accidental Billionaires. But I was speaking with a guy named Olaf Olafsson, who was at Sony during that time period. And he has probably the coolest name ever, but he also was in charge of uh, Sony Publishing um, Entertainment, which back then, you know, Sony was a third party. They made games through mostly through their company, ImageSoft, that were for Nintendo. And uh, I was asking him about sort of seeing it from that um, perspective before eventually creating the PlayStation and launching that. And he said to me um, very explicitly, you know, I met with Howard Lincoln and the other guys at Nintendo, and they treated us like slaves on a plantation. And I was like, whoa, that's pretty charged language there. Um, are you sure? He's like, yeah, it was terrible. You know, they dictated their terms. They treated us like slaves. Um, and so, you know, those, those two business books I had mentioned had kind of been my inspiration up to that point. And I felt like after that meeting with um, Olaf, I started really seeing this as sort of Game of Thrones. Um, and it was these rival companies, each feeling like they were destined to uh, rise to the top or at least deserve certain things or were being slighted in certain ways. Um, and so in the particular case of Sony, um, their story, which is sort of lurks throughout this narrative and is sort of like the third party that you don't even realize is going to be entering the race, is in uh, 1991, at the uh, Summer Consumer Electronics Show, Sony and Nintendo were supposed to announce that they had, um, that Sony had made a CD attachment for the Super Nintendo that would be like the equivalent of the Sega CD, but for the Nintendo. Um, and on May 31st, 1991, Olaf uh, made a presentation that was not heavily attended because Sony was a small player at the time and said, you know, I'm pleased to announce that uh, Nintendo and Sony will be making this device. And then the next day, Nintendo had their presentation. And uh, this was much more heavily attended. And Howard Lincoln said, we're pleased to announce that we're doing a CD attachment. And Olaf was like, yeah. And then he said, and it's going to be with Philips. And so um, you know, they very publicly slighted Sony. Um, you know, <laughs> that also speaks to a lot of what Nintendo did during this time. It's not always, you know, most of life, I don't think, is what you say, but how you say it. Um, and they didn't always have the best bedside manner, or they at least wanted to put their foot down when they could. Um, and so they went out of their way to embarrass Sony and not work with Sony during that time period to have what would have been the Nintendo PlayStation or some early iteration of that. And you know what I always loved about Sega was you know it was everything about them in those early years was just sort of a lemons to lemonade strategy. And Tom Kalinske saw that and thought, all right, well I hate Nintendo too. Um, you know, let's talk. Um, and so they met. Um, Tom met with Olaf Olafsson. They developed a close relationship, and they ended up, um, you know, they were releasing their own C Sega CD system, and uh, they did not have the necessary software just in terms of quantity to get it out there. And they said to Sony, you know, you guys are having a lot of trouble with Nintendo, not approving your titles, not letting you make as many as you want, which is not giving you the opportunity to um, recoup your investment. You know, why don't you make as many games as you want for the Sega CD? We'll be partners in this. Um, we'll even have our guys teach you how to make games because you know one thing that I didn't realize early on or just didn't occur to me was Sega and Nintendo did have a lineage in the arcade market, um, whereas Sony didn't and and Microsoft too didn't. So they were sort of even more outsiders into the console world, and so Sega and Sony worked closely together. 
they actually, when Sega officially launched the Sega CD, they had a press conference in New York, and, and Olaf was there um, by their side. Like, it was very much almost like a joint venture. Um, and from that point, that had gone so well that Sega of America and Tom wanted to create the next generation console together um, and, and you know, continue to team up against Nintendo. And they had produced, um, for six months, Sega and Sony uh, worked in conjunction to make what would have been the Sega PlayStation, um, and something that I think would have done better than the Sega Saturn. Um, but Tom brought this to Sega of Japan, and they rejected the idea, and they, they broke up the partnership. And that was kind of you know, what was really <laughs> fun for me with this project, going in, I assumed that the battle between Sega and Nintendo, um, that the most interesting story, the most interesting conflict in the book would be Sega and Nintendo. But it turned out to really be Sega of America and Sega of Japan, and these cultural differences that really, I think, resulted in the, in the failure of the company. Um, as much as we all think Sega and Nintendo, and it brings us back to a certain time, or at least reminds us of a corporate battle, um, that was not the case in Japan. Um, over here, Sega did go from 5% of the market to 55 or 60%. In Japan, they never really had more than 15 or 20% of the market. So they had the same exact products, the same exact games, but over there they were not successful, and over here they were. And that created enormous friction between America and Japan, not just of the cultural um, confusion and of that nature, but these were the people, for the most part, they were making all the hardware and they were making the majority of the software, and they were watching their subsidiary succeed, and their, um, their dictatorial um, leader, Hayao Nakayama, who was known to walk around with a golf club and whack things and was a very intimidating force, would say to them, you know, why are you guys not as successful as they are in America? And there's a, there's a lot of reasons why. I think some of it is um, just their risk appetite, which was much more limited than those in America. Um, but another thing is, you know, there are the laws against uh, monopolies and, and monopolistic practices in Japan are um, much easier than they are over here, and Nintendo had much more of a stranglehold. Um, but, you know, the book sort of um, presents that dynamic and says that as a result of that conflict, that civil war going on during this council war, that's the reason that Sony ended up going on their own and Sega ended up with a failed hardware system. And, uh, I guess you know Sony was laughing all the way to the bank in the end, and uh, it's just really—it was kind of sad to uh, read all about that. And uh, for me, you know, there because of this conflict with Japan, and because things didn't end up rosy for Sega, um, you know, hearing that from Tom Kalinske and Al Nilsson and all the other employees, I was uh, at first, admittedly, a little bit skeptical about um, the role that Japan had played at Sega. I, I thought, you know, that was, was a little bit of revisionist history or them blaming all the failures on Japan and taking credit for all the successes. And that's you know, possibly true to some extent. But in the middle of the project, I got hired by Sega to go to Japan and shoot some short documentaries for them. Um, and I was hired by Sega of America to go interview developers from Sega of Japan. And I saw firsthand that to this day, the conflict between both sides is terrible. Um, it's everything that Sega of America asked for, Sega of Japan wouldn't give them. And it was always done in a passive aggressive way. Um, and it was, it was sad, you know, and I guess that also lent a lot of credibility to me for uh, what I was hearing, even though it was 20 years later. So I think uh, in the modern era of video games, a lot of um, developers sort of gain a lot of prominence, right? And there's, uh, they sort of become super celebrities yeah. in their own right. Uh, I just had, um, I haven't read the full book yet, but I was wondering if you, if was that also true back then? Were there like superstar developers? Obviously, the whole game media industry wasn't sort of as developed, so maybe they weren't um, as prominent in sort of the game development environment or culture. But were they there? Were there like a few superstar developers that were sort of yeah doing that? No, that's and a good also, question. How did Sega court them if they were there? Like, how did um, they get them to join the dark they, side? There were maybe within the companies the superstar developers, but even even when those internally were aware, they weren't treated as such. They were treated just like any other employee. Um, I mean, particularly uh, Shigeru Miyamoto at Nintendo and Yuji Naka at Sega, um, both responsible for Mario and Sonic, respectively, and a bunch of other games. Um, you know, were sort of like the golden geese at each company that were popping out these great titles. But they were not um, treated very well there. Um, they did not, you know, even early on, get their names in the credits. Um, and actually, one thing I never realized was that after Sonic, one, after the first Sonic game came out and was enormously successful, um, Yuji Naka, because he was upset about the lack of credit and the, 
lack of respect that he and his team had gotten. Um, they weren't even allowed to put their names in the credits. Um, that they quit, um, or he quit Sega, and uh, it took um, Shinobu Toyota um, from Sega of America going over there and bringing him to Sega of America where he worked at what they called the Sega Technical Institute, which was supposed to be sort of a fusion of East and West. And um, they actually made Sonic 2 in America. Um, and I felt like, you know, in terms of this cultural conflict, that was sort of the high point for this relationship. That was my favorite game back then, and I think also uh, showed what was best from both sides of the company. But it wasn't really until um, I think Sony entered the picture and until um, games became much a little bit more sophisticated and uh, CD based that the developers got the respect that they were due and were treated like the rock stars that they were. I mean, my book for the most part focuses on the business side and the executive side and they deserve all the credit in the world, but you know, at the end of the day what they were selling, the underlying products were being made by these developers. They were the ones creating the content, creating the IPs and um, I think historically they haven't been treated very well and even um, nowadays at those big uh, companies, particularly the Japanese companies, I still think that they don't really get the respect that they're due. Hey. Um, Sega and Sony are really, I mean, Sega and Nintendo are really friendly right now. Yeah. Sonics and Smash Brothers and they have that Winter Olympics game. Is that weird for people working there? Like, yeah. are they upset? Yeah. I mean, for me, um, I remember my seven-year-old cousin, I was telling him about the project I was working on. I said, do you know Sonic? And he said, oh, yeah, I know Sonic. He's friends with Mario. And I was like, no, he hates Mario. <laughs> um, so it's weird for me. Uh, um, but also, one of, the best, or one of the most fun parts for me as a, as a writer and filmmaker throughout all this is that speaking with people from Sega and Nintendo, they still hate the other one. You know, it wasn't like... I kind of initially pitched it as a Magic Johnson and Larry Bird, like two tough competitors that pushed each other to another level, but kind of put their arms around each other at the end. But that was not the case here. Um, because they both dislike one another so much and still don't have any kind things to say, they, they hate the idea. It's blasphemous that Sonic and Mario would be together. Um, so, uh, and, you know, I, I hate seeing it, though I guess it makes sense because Nintendo really has. Um, planted a flag in what Sega used to paint them to be, which was that they were the uncool company, or at least the one that was focused on kid-friendly products. And Sonic really still is kind of that kid-friendly product that my seven-year-old cousin would know. So um, it's weird to me that they work together, but I think it actually makes a lot of sense from a business standpoint at this point. All right, uh, let's just give uh, Blake a great you know, round of applause for coming. And um... thank you. And there are uh, copies of his books available from McNally uh, Booksellers at a subsidized price. So if you're interested in that, um, please go and purchase them. I'm sure Blake would be happy to field any individual questions. Sort yeah, of I'm casually. happy to sign any books or I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, I really do love this topic, not just because I grew up with it, but I found it so fascinating. I kind of felt like even if this was about rival tissue companies, it would have been 90% as interesting. Um, and I still continue to do interviews and speak with people and try to learn more, even though at this point, I mean, maybe it'll be in the paperback version or maybe it'll be in something else, but I just find it personally interesting. So feel free to ask me anything. I love talking about it. Thanks so much, guys. I really appreciate it.